Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be talking about some of the promises that President Obama made on the campaign trail and how well he's carrying those out in office. We'll also be talking about the TSA, as well as a man who was arrested in Florida. That coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Thank you very much for tuning in to a brand new edition of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, as Toby. And Nick. And it's the first show of a 2012 that we're doing, so Happy New Year to everyone. Um, glad to be with you, and hopefully it'll be an exciting year with some good news to talk about. More we'll good see. news than last year. I think we said this at the beginning of 2011. Too. And it, it always seems to be doom and gloom, all the predictions we've been saying of sort of coming true and we're going to be getting into one of those Told predictions we wrong more often in 2012 right one of the things we talked about a lot in 2011 was the tsa and we made some predictions uh what would happen the t to the tsa and how it would start to spread out beyond airports and we have a story about that uh coming up in the latter half of today's show as well as some of the campaign promises uh barack obama made we also predicted when he was elected years ago, but also in 2011, that he'd be breaking those. Um, so we've been talking about that, and we have some of those to be getting into. Um, but first, I want to talk about a man who was arrested in Florida. Florida, Nick, you brought this up in the little intro piece. This man, by the name of Nick Christie, was actually arrested over two and a half years ago. Uh, but we're going to talk about him today because some disturbing news has come out. I guess it's kind of been building for a couple of years, but Fox 13 in Tampa, Florida, has been reporting on this new news that was brought out by the District 21 medical examiner that ruled this poor man was de um, killed by homicide. This man, Chris Christie, uh, Nick Christie, 62 old man from Ohio, was detained by Lee County Sheriff's Office's um, Sheriff's Office for being publicly intoxicated. He was then pepper sprayed 10 times over a 48-hour period, and he died as a result of cardiac failure from the pepper spray. Now, let's get into this a little bit. Why was he arrested? Well, Christie's wife asked that he be taken to the hospital. Apparently, he had been a little bit depressed, and he went down to Florida. She called the police and hoped that they'd be taking him to the hospital. But in instead of taking to the, him to the hospital, Lee County um, sheriffs decided to strip him naked, restrain him to a chair, and then pepper spray him, and in the lawsuit, 10 times over a 48-hour period, until he died. Um, District 21 medical examiner, as I stated, ruled his death a homicide because he was restrained and sprayed with pepper uh, by law enforcement officers. But, and this is why this is such a big deal, to this day, nobody has ever been charged with a crime. And in fact, Lee County State Attorney cleared the sheriff's office who did the strapping down and the pepper spraying from any wrongdoing. In addition, he also, in that picture that you saw, he had a, um, uh, a spit guard tied across his face, um, which he had been asking them to take off him because he couldn't breathe. You can see in this photo up on the screen that he is dripping that stuff all over his body. That's pepper spray. That's stuff that's burning into him. Over, uh, according to this lawsuit, over a two-day period, he was um, subject to this treatment, stripped naked, strapped to the chair, pepper sprayed until he was dead. And his crime? being publicly intoxicated. Now, a lot of the time you'll hear police um, officers take people into public custody or protective custody. It varies from state to state, um, county to county, across the country. But that's to protect an individual from themselves. It's also others. It doesn't seem that Nick Christie was really protected. It seems more like, at least from the description here, the photos, the video that we saw, that he was being tortured. But for what exactly, I am not sure, because he was a depressed man who went to Florida and then got drunk and then was picked up, put in public custody, restrained, stripped, pepper sprayed to death. As a result, he died, and yet, and the uh, medical examiner ruled it a homicide, yet the Lee County State Attorney cleared, his, the, uh, cleared the sheriff's office from any wrongdoing. Nick, well, it's, well, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm ba baffled, it's confused. A I've, repeated, homicide, right? I've I mean, repeated myself a few times, right. but that's because I'm trying to process in my mind right. how this works. I mean, I think the lowest charge you could come up with here is probably voluntary manslaughter. I'm not sure how the homicide laws 
work in Florida, but the, you know, obviously the act was willful. They pepper sprayed him when it, you know, I don't see how that was in any way necessary. He was restrained. Pepper sprayed him 10 times over two days. And I mean, that's going to cause an immense amount of physical discomfort. And, you know, after chronic exposure to pepper spray like that, yeah, I mean, especially in a 62-year-old man who may not be in the greatest health to begin with, you know, that's going to put enough of a strain on you that it would probably be the primary factor in your death, which but why? apparently it was here. So, I mean, they willfully did something which I would argue you could reasonably believe, you know, you could reasonably believe would lead to somebody's death. And, you know, maybe it wasn't malicious. Maybe their intent wasn't to kill. But at best, I would think second degree murder or voluntary manslaughter. But they've been cleared of all wrongdoing, Nick. They committed homicide, yet... Cleared right. of all wrongdoing. Right, and typically the only way you can you can be cleared of wrongdoing during a homicide is to argue justification. And again, I'm not too familiar with what the statutes are in Florida, but typically the only way you can argue justification is if it's in a because it's an affirmative defense. You're saying I was justified in killing this person, and in most states you can only do that if they were a danger to your life or the life of others, or if you were you know they were posing a real threat of bodily harm or something like that to others. Uh, restraining somebody to a chair and killing them because you felt like it, I don't think, you know, you could be, you could argue, successfully argue justification under any state's law in this country. So, I don't get it either, Toby. It sounds like they got away with murder. Sounds awful. Not only mor murder, but torturous Torture, right. murder. I mean, just the irritation from pepper spray on your skin over a few minutes is not fun. And I've had pepper spray on my skin. Especially being strapped to a chair where right. you can't move right. and naked. As well, oh, man. Yeah, through, and Poor th guy. then you imagine, you know, your eyes, your sinuses, your lungs, your skin being irritated over a forty-eight hour. And he was period. doused. He right. was not. I just mean, you might as well. You, you really might as, as well burn the person with. I mean, you're causing chemical burns on their body if it's over that long a period of time. So basically, you might as well have burned him to death. I mean, frankly, I mean, well, his I, heart I mean, is what stopped. Well, heart failure probably because of a strain that the pepper spray put on his respiratory system would be my guess. Or maybe just shock. Well. After being tortured for two days. It's a horrible, horrible case for of murder. For being drunk. I mean, just for, for being. I drunk mean, and depressed. It's not like he had. Not that it would be appropriate to torture somebody to death for other crimes, but it's not like he had hurt anybody else or attempted to hurt anybody yeah. else. Maybe he said something that the deputies didn't like. So. I mean, when I kill, if I were to kill people, when I kill people, if I were to kill people for something <laughs> they said that I didn't like, probably going to get charged with murder, rightly so. It's really not a, yeah. a, you know, a good reason to kill somebody. Now, I'm not trying to say that all police officers are bad in doing this stuff, because they're not, Nick. No. But it doesn't take too many of them doing this kind of stuff that we talk about week after week to paint them all with a very broad brush in people's eyes. And I, I think it's stories like this that give cops a very bad name so how about well especially when people get away with it when I they get that, away with it that's the problem yeah. the cops who did this still on the force still protecting and serving today so it's it's upsetting to me but i guess it'll go on as it always does and we'll have more <laughs> stories like this to talk about throughout the year 2012 how many pepper spray deaths do will we talk about this we well, had a taser death we talked about uh, many in 2011 <laughs> many so. of them in 2011 yeah. we'll see that's how many a bit more, more common taser death pepper spray deaths are not terribly Takes common quite a bit well, right two days of concentrated exposure would do it anyways i'm sure we'll talk about more instances of police abuse i say we, i don't want to talk about them just follow the guidelines protect and serve don't actually go out there and kill and maim how about that all right, let's 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 move right along. Let's talk about uh, Mr. Abuma, the president, <laughs> and his campaigning. Uh, yeah, well, when he was campaigning for the office of president of the United States, uh, he, he made a number of statements, Toby. He made it pretty clear that his position on uh, medical marijuana was that he, uh, the quote here is that he did not believe it was an efficient use of our resources. So he did not want the Justice Department to be using its resources to arrest medical marijuana users or crack down on medical marijuana dispensaries in states where it was legal under state law. However, that was back in the campaign, back leading up to 2008. Okay, and he really so, did say this. Let's actually, yeah. before we talk about what he's actually done, and I know we've been talking about it over There's the last few years. There's a discrepancy here that we should probably is. address. Let's, let's show the people him campaigning um, back in 2008, and then we'll talk about what he actually did when he got elected to office, or what is his administration. Uh, our marijuana laws. Did you inhale? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I was, I was telling somebody asked this question. I said uh, that was the point. My attitude is, if the science and doctors suggest that the best palliative care, the best way to relieve pain and suffering, is through medical marijuana, then I, that's something that I'm open to. In the, because there's no difference between that and morphine. When it comes to just giving people relief from pain. The wrong way to go about it is simply to think that if you just crack down, lock up, don't care about recidivism rates, etc., that somehow you're going to see major improvement. And unfortunately, that's been the approach that we've taken, particularly when it comes to nonviolent drug offenses. I would not have the Justice Department prosecuted the lady. So he probably would stop the raids, stop arresting people for um, dispensing well, medical marijuana. Right. In states well, and he was legal. even alluding to the fact that the the war on drugs approach that we have with drug prohibition today, in general. I mean, he didn't get quite as specific talking about how you handle recreational use of, yeah. of narcotics, but. I mean, the, the implication in a lot of his campaigning was that he believed it was time to reevaluate the approach that we take to drug policy in the United States. And in terms of what he said when he was campaigning, I personally, don't, I, he didn't go far enough to really, for me to really agree with his position. Um, but he was headed in the right direction. I, it sounded like he was taking a much more reasonable stance than most of the other politicians out there, Toby. But when we look at what hap what's happening now, even in terms of medical marijuana, which is illegal under state law, and which, in my opinion, the federal government has no constitutional authority to regulate without an amendment, as they needed to regulate alcohol when they prohibited that, uh, we see that raids continue in California, Montana, Washington State. We've now got states petitioning the DEA, Colorado, Vermont are among them, petitioning the DEA to have marijuana rescheduled just as a, as a class two drug, which would put it in the same category as, you know, heavy duty painkillers and opiates like oxycodone. But they're not even, so far, they've been unwilling to even reschedule marijuana as a schedule two drug, which simply means that in certain applications, it does have a medical use. The claim they make now is that marijuana has absolutely zero legitimate medical application to the point where they can't even study its medical uses in the United States. So, uh, you know, what progress has actually been made here? What change we're seeing in the approach, uh, you know, to medical marijuana between the Bush administration and the Obama administration? I don't know, Toby. I mean, this is just one promise he's broken. I think any, a, a lot of people who, you, who are traditional Democratic voters are disappointed with him for the stand he's taken on civil liberties. And it was, you know, just the end of 2011, December 31st, he signed the National Defense Authorization Act. And he, he was the first president to completely legalize the indefinite military detention of Americans without trial. Uh, this, he's been a worse president on civil liberties issues. I think at the end of his administration, we will have lost more ground in terms of civil liberties in this country than we did under the Bush administration. Maybe the Bush administration got the ball rolling, but this past year has not been has not been good for people who care about civil liberties. And it's really President Obama's fault, period. A lot of the stuff he could have killed, he didn't. He said he had some reservations about this, you know, the continuing the medical marijuana raids, signing the NDAA. He can say whatever he wants, Toby, but it, it, when you look at what he's actually done as president, he has butchered the Constitution. Oh, absolutely. And yes, the raids are continuing. They're still arresting people for growing medicine, even though it's legal in those states. So, well, I'm not surprised we did predict that would be the case. Unfortunately, once again, we were correct, and I'm not trying to say that under the next president it'll be any different. Um, Republican or Democrat. Republican or Democrat. It, it's not really going to make that much difference. Chances are whoever we're given us, our next benevolent dictator, will continue to go down the same road we will, continue to yeah. eviscerate the Constitution, continue to carry on these foreign wars, continue to go after um, civil liberties, on and on and on. The role of government will grow larger and larger, and it will Certainly become more pervasive in lives. I mean, here in New Hampshire, we actually did, for the first time, ever see a real significant cut in, in state government. Sure, but most but, of that was in the social arena, where it, right. the arguably prices, the cuts should be done right. very, very last. They increased law enforcement budgets, so instead yeah. of instead of providing care for Prisons people with mental war. issues... Prisons and war is what we're getting. Right, the, instead of caring for people who have 
are down on their luck, have mental disabilities. They just put them in prison. They just put them in the prison. So that's the cuts we're getting. So I, I don't think they're real cuts. People are he saying, yes, we got the, we slashed the government. Well, we slashed social services and then increased law enforcement. So now we just have the people, instead of getting help in the community, they get to have their help mm -hmm. under lock and key after they create a crime yeah, which and is hurt the, someone. Which is the wrong way to go, unfortunately. Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, actually, you know. It's I, actually disgusting. Looking back a few years, back to when, well, several years at this point, but, uh, you know, Governor Benson was actually, I think, more willing to take a look at actually making changes to drug policy. He talked about it quite a bit, talking about early releases for nonviolent drug offenders and things like that than the current governor. So. It, it, the, the, the law and order mentality, which I don't think has too much to do with providing basic order for the functioning of society, the, the lock them up mentality. Yeah. Lock everybody up. That's I'll the answer for them. everything. Is, Especially it, when most of the people behind bars have mental issues, are mentally sick, I don't think you're going to be teaching them any kind of lesson. So. No, I mean, yeah, typically they, people with mental problems are going to react differently to things like that than right. normal people. That's why, that's why they have problems and typically yeah. run afoul of the laws because they're not necessarily processing things the same way you and I might be. Right, and that's why people people will get all mad at me for saying that we should still be providing these social services and yeah, um, well, to people. Well, guess what? It's going from a fiscal perspective. It's much cheaper to provide services in the community than it is well, to wait until they commit a crime and lock them I like, up. I like, I like the stance Ron Paul takes on it, which is, and, he, and he's somebody who's calling for an end, you know, on the federal level anyway, an end to pretty much all the welfare programs that exist. But he's, he's also willing to point out that you can only do that once the economy starts to improve once it, you know, you, you can't. That's the last right, thing that's you a, cut. Right. I mean, you need to cut. Not the first. You need to drastically cut military expenditures first, and then there's a whole bunch of other benefit programs that benefit people who make six, seven figures, frankly. A lot of the welfare out there are things like farm subsidies, you know, giveaways to big, you know, big pharma, the aerospace industry. Those are the things that you need to be cutting. Foreign uh, aid. Right. I mean, sorry, before you start touching welfare, NASA needs to be taken out back. And I love shot. space. I love space, too. Space is awesome. I don't like the idea of having to take, you know, the replacement for the shuttle program out back and shooting it. But if you're somebody who's going to make the argument that we need smaller government, which we do, I, I can't see how you justify cutting off people who have become dependent. And frankly, the government has screwed up the economy, in yeah. my opinion. They're a big part of the problem. They screwed up the economy to the point where the middle class is having a hard time getting by and just pulling programs that, you know, offer medical benefits to children and things like that, uh, those are definitely not the first areas you need to cut. You need yeah. to start rolling back in other areas, and, you know, I, I yeah. think that leads to a healthier not economy. Overall. Not only that, but look at what's going to happen. All the people who are for small government, and they actually got some through, they got actually here in New Hampshire and all over the country, the Tea Partiers, they got elected um, to offices and they slashed government, but they slashed in the places that really hurt the lower class, the middle class, that really hurts. So guess what's going to happen to all of those people? Guess what's going to happen right. to the idea of small well, government in general? Right, and well, and, but the problem is making even the 10% cut, whether it's on the state level or on the federal level, really when you're tinkering like that, you can make cuts that are painful to certain people who, who were relying on certain programs. But even if you went fairly aggressively after uh, you know, welfare programs and things like that, you, you would not say you cut 5 or 10% of the federal budget. Well you're not getting anywhere close to where the budget was just a couple of years ago. So if your argument is, and I, I agree with the logic, that if you drastically roll back the size and scope of government, it, it, it frees up a lot of resources for the productive economy. There's a lot more wealth to go around, period. So you're more likely to be able to fill those aid programs yeah. and things like charity uh, and have religious groups do it and things like that. Well, that's not going to happen if you cut five or 10%. What no. you really need to do is start cutting in other areas and drastically start scaling back the size of government. And as you're doing that, then you do need to look at cutting a lot of these programs that you, know, you really do have to have a plan. Oh, and absolutely. there will be pain at some point. I, oh, I'm worried yes. that at this point, if they don't do anything, we're going to see a point where these programs are no longer solvent. Very true. And the results are going to be worse because the economy will be in much worse shape. Yes. And then old people, the young, with, you know, the infirm, they're going to be basically kicked out on the sidewalk, which is what happened in the Soviet Union. It's what typically happens when you have a, a financial crisis. Sure, very true. I just think that when you're cutting government, you need to be smart about it, have a plan, and not just...
go after certain foundations first before while you dismantle while you're the increasing roof. military spending right. and homeland security and budget police state and, and yeah. yeah let's let's be smart but, about this and the only yeah. candidate i did say that the next president um yes ron paul would be a different story but um, let's face it, I don't it's think a long it's, haul it's a very that. long, long, long haul. And uh, I love the poll numbers. I love what's happening, but I'm still, uh, I don't want to get too excited about something that I think the establishment is not going no, to No, I don't think we're going to see any <laughs> real political reforms come out of that. No, game. there's I, too much money involved. I think the only good happen. thing it does is it does kind of shift the debate back in the direction where we actually, you know, instead of debating how the government's going to socialize medicine or et cetera, et cetera, how we're going to keep the military spread around the world. What, what the Paul campaign has done is it has brought back into the debate the question of, do we want the government to run health care? Do we want the government to run retirement systems? Do we want the government to be fighting these wars overseas at all? Not just, should we invade Iran or Syria, or should we have you know, Obamacare or single payer? It, it, it does do a lot to shift the debate. None of the other Republicans would have, done, would have actually debated on principled different terms. So right. maybe in the future it'll plant some seeds and people will start to think about things differently. But immediately, immediate political reform, I'm not so confident in. Speaking of one place that if Ron Paul was elected, one area of government that would start to go away would be the TSA. And we do have a serious story we're going to be getting into. Unfortunately, some of the predictions we made over the last few years about the TSA are coming true. But first, let's start off with a little bit of humor. A Massachusetts woman who flew home from Las Vegas this week says an airport security officer took her frosted cupcake because he thought its vanilla uh, bourbon icing could be a security risk. And I know lots of people can probably relate to the TSA over the holiday season. A lot of people were traveling, going through the, the um, security checkpoints at airports around the country. Rebecca Haynes told ABCNews.com today that the Transportation Security Administration an agent at Las Vegas McCarran International Airport confiscated her cupcake, saying the frosting sitting on top of the red velvet cake was a gel-like enough su substance to violate regulations. Haynes, a teacher, said the cupcake was a gift from one of her students. Ah, oh, she didn't know where it was from. It could have been a bomb. She was traveling with her husband and toddler and thought that the youngster might get hungry along the long trip. Um, we also had a small pile of hummus sandwiches with creamy fillings, which made it through. But the cupcake, with its frosting, was apparently a terrorist threat. I just don't know what in the world he was thinking, said Haynes, uh, speaking about the TSA officer. You know, all, one, one thing that's a little bit strange about this story is that the cupcake had actually already traveled through a different TSA checkpoint. Uh, the TSA at Logan International Airport said that the cupcakes looked delicious and told us to have a great trip before two of such cupcakes passed through security. But in Las Vegas, such cupcakes were deemed too dangerous to fly. They shouldn't be delicious in one part of the country and a security threat in another, Haynes said. Um, Haynes called the TSA Security Theater. Hey, maybe she watch, watches the show. That's what we've been calling it for a year, Security Theater. Um, in general, cupcake pies are allowed in carry-on luggage. TSA spokesman James Fontaines told ABC uh, affiliate WCVB. Um, he also added that they're looking into this serious incident. So anyways, I thought it would be just humorous. Some people, some people I went to the airport a couple of times over the break, and I opted for the, the invasive pat-down instead of going through the body scanners. You know, just my little form of protest, if I will. Amazingly, they really don't want to pat you down. They do not like the idea of having to invasively touch you. And they asked me Most why. Most of them don't. No. I'm sure so, some TSA agent out there is a weirdo and likes it. I mean, you know, in the case of the agents that you got, yeah, they, they didn't, didn't like it. They did everything they could to talk me out of it. And were very apologetic for all the touching that they had to do. Uh, thought that it was silly of me to want to protest. They said, I, they asked me why I told them that. Um, I th thought that if everyone objected, we'd have to go through about things differently. They told me, no, everyone would get this pat down. Really? I don't think anyone would make it onto an airplane if everyone had to take the time it takes to get this invasive pat down. But hey, whatever. I, they really don't want to do it, though. If everyone was doing it, I think it would be... No, well, the individual them. agents are the ones who make the rules, and they might not care. Well, they also said that. They said, we are not in Washington. We'll just go through the scanner, will ya? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Nope. <laughs> Less humorous than the cupcakes yeah. and even having to be invasively patted down are the security, the TSA spreading from airports yeah, to other well, parts of the country. We 
Now been you may have to forfeit your baked goods, and you may, you know, be stripped naked either by electronic means or very literally, if you don't want to be stripped by the uh, by the scanners. Not only when you're going to the airport, uh, but anywhere. Uh, anywhere where you might be traveling. Uh, and this story, the LA Times reported on one man, Rick Vetter, who was rushing uh, uh, on board the Amtrak train in Charlotte, North Carolina, on a recent Sunday afternoon when a canine officer suddenly blocked the way. Three federal air marshals in bulletproof vests and two officers trained to spot suspicious behavior. Watch closely as Psycho, a uh, German shepherd, nosed Vetter's trousers for chemical traces of a bomb. Radiation detectors carried by the marshals scanned the 57-year-old lawyer for concealed nuclear materials. Did you say the dog's name was Psycho? I think it's Seiko. Oh. S-E-I-K-O. <laughs> right. it, it might be Psycho. I mean, you could pronounce it the same way. Um, and they also talk about um, checkpoints that they've set up for surface travel, i.e. Uh, highway travel. And there's even a quote in here that says, we are not, oh yeah, we are not the airport security administration, said Ray Deneen, the air marshal in charge of the TSA office in Charlotte. We take that transportation part seriously. That's a bus, that's a train, that could be private transportation, period. Whether you're on the highway, you know, you're riding on Greyhound, you're taking the train. Now, if you want to travel, a lot of people said, well, you know, if you, if you don't like the airport, you can always take a bus, you can always take a train. It takes a lot longer. And some people did, Toby. Some people legitimately didn't like the security, so they drove or they took a bus or whatever. Now, gradually, they are moving the TSA, you know, to train lines, to, to interstate checkpoints. No way around it. And the things that they do in the airport that we don't like, well, they'll be doing that to us on the side of the road. And people, when or this gets popular, station. when this gets popular, just, just like they did. It. Well, last, we need this last to keep year, us safe. last year, at uh, first there was a little protest. People were going, "Oh, this we this is crazy. We don't want to have to go through the naked bo body scans." People were like, "This is crazy." It got in newspapers. There was going to be a protest, and now, while my time in the airport, I was the only person who opted for the invasive pat down. So, uh, not too many people protesting it, and soon it will just be normal. Unfortunately, that's our the next prediction. Normal. The yeah. new norm. Well, that's what happens, Toby, is that, I mean, they put these things in place. People grumble a little and, bit. Oh, that's all. That but stinks. But it's, it's not their hill to but die okay. on. They just want to get to where they're going. And it becomes accepted as a new normal. And then as soon as they get that in place, they, they push the envelope a little bit further. And this is how, you know, this is how you get a police state. And that's where we're headed. That's what we are getting gradually. Not as bad as some of the other police states. Not North Korea. No. Nope. But it is, it is very much a different country than it was prior to September 11th, and it was about a decade ago. It's, yeah. it's a very different And country. it will be very different in five years and ten years, and I would say at this point... And it's point, not changing for the better. The terrorists have won. They've gotten exactly what they want. I, I don't know if it's really the terrorists that won. I think that, I think that political opportunists have won. Well, I'd define I, that as another form I, of I, I think that Washington We're out of time tonight, writes Nick. a lot more than the terrorists did. We're out of time this week. FreeMindsTV.com. In the meantime, all the archives, ways to donate to the show, show content, notes all up there. FreeMindsTV.com. Until next week, Toby here. And Nick. Have a good one.